We're on session five of Remnant Boot Camp, and I want to remind everybody that beginning this week, we're going to go on an every other week schedule for, for filming to allow me to uh, spend more time with uh, the book that I'm developing. I've been enjoying this. The, the, the first John is this so rich, and I want to pick up today with first John chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. And he's emphasizing some things that he already had spoken with them about in chapter 1 in relation to the relationship to God, the forgiveness of sins, and ability to overcome. He's saying, listen, this, this is in, in chapter 1, he was saying, listen, these are some things that we have to have, the only way we can have fellowship with one another is to have fellowship with God. And that when we have the proper fellowship with God, when, we come, when we're, our sins are forgiven, that the blood of Jesus continually cleanses of our sins and enables us to uh, overcome the enemy. And now he begins comforting them by saying, you guys have done this. I think that's awesome that we can enter into a place that God says, you know, not only do I show you this in my word, but I'm encouraging you that you've done it. Let's pick up here verse 12. And I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that that is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Isn't that exactly what he was sharing in the beginning of chapter 1? He's saying, listen, guys, you have entered into that relationship with God the Father and God the Son. And you have known the olive tab that I shared with you was from the beginning. That's the essence of, of true biblical Christianity is that we have been, we, because of the blood of Jesus and because of what he has done for us, that we have an intimate relationship with Father God. In fact, the Greek word there for, for known, he says, you have known the Father is gen oske, which means to know, to learn, to get to know, to get a knowledge of, to perceive. But I like this. It's also a Jewish idiom dealing with the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. There's that intimacy. And he said, it's not that you have heard about God. You you do that when you hear the gospel. All of a sudden, you find out there is a God. He has standards. You find out that you have violated those standards. But the good news is that he came and he offered himself on the cross for us. That's the gospel. And once I enter into that, all of a sudden, I begin developing an intimacy with God. it's It's not just that I have heard about him, but I now experience his presence. I now have this intimate relationship with him that I talk with him, he talks with me. He shows me the things that I need to do. And it's out of that relationship that true biblical Christianity is birthed. It's not a relationship with an institution. It's not a relationship with other people that call themselves believers. It is that intimate relationship with God himself that we draw strength from. If our strength in our religious walk is not drawn from our, from our relationship with God, you're not, really, you're not actually having a relationship that the Bible outlines. You're being religious. And, it's, and guys, in these last days, we can't play with religiosity. We can't do it. It'll get you killed. It'll get you to where you're going to get swept up with that antichrist spirit. And he says, listen, because you have been forgiven, because you have entered into that relationship and you do know him, you have begun getting victory over the wicked one. And I don't know about you, but I, that, that's, the, that's the way to get real victory in our lives, is that the, a life that is birthed out of intimate relationship with God will always overcome the enemy, will always, will always lead you out through the other end of the valley of temptation, of the valley of the shadow of death. It will always get you there. Because God's walking with you. Then he goes on, he says, I want you to be strong, picking up here in verse 14. And I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I have written to you, young men, because ye are strong. Now that, that is something powerful, because a lot of Christians right now that I know, I can't really say that they're strong. They're religious. But they're not strong. And he's saying, listen, I can write you young men because you're strong 
And why are you strong? And the word of God abideth in you. Remember he said in the, in the last chapter that if, if the word of God abides in you and you abide in that word and you start doing it, then the love of God is perfected because you're keeping his commandments. That word abide there in the Greek is meno, which means to remain, to abide, to sojourn, not to depart, to be held, kept continually. And right now, the, the spirit of this world is trying to take us from this. Much of the preaching that we hear today are snippets of the word that are paced together with almost surgical accuracy to make the word say something that it didn't say. And it's intermingled with both pop psychology and occultic references or occultic meaning. They try to get deep from drawing from things that actually never originated with God. We don't need to sound deep by pulling from Babylon. That's the very thing that we're supposed to be delivered from. But we have got to abide in the word. And here's the way that I, I define abiding is abiding is learning plus meditation in, meditating on the word. First you learn it, and then you begin rolling it over and pondering it in your mind. But then you have to add this third element, otherwise you have deceived yourselves. you got to start doing it. That if I learn it, meditate on it, and do it, I am abiding in the word. And when you add those three elements together to equal abiding in the word, you are going to get strength in your walk with God and strength to handle the tsunami of influence that's coming from the world. If you don't do that, you are not going to be strong. And because we say, well, I don't have the time. Well, you seem to have the time for everything else. Even if, Come on. You have the time for everything else you want to do. Even if it comes down to where one verse at a time, take a, a power verse, write it down on a three-by-five card, stick it in your pocket, and memorize it, but go beyond even memorization. There are a lot of people that I know that have memorized Scripture that have never meditated on it to get the application. You see, when you're chewing on it, you're rolling it around in your mind and you're praying on it, that's the job of the Holy Spirit to begin showing you the proper way to implement that which you're memorizing. And I've seen people only memorize half the verse. They memorize the promise half of the verse without re memorizing the commandment part of the verse that's always connected to the promise. Because I do, I am strong in him. God has always said, if you do this, you'll get this. Even to the place of salvation, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. If you don't call on his name, what's going to happen? You're not going to get saved. If you don't hear the gospel, you can't believe the gospel. If you don't believe the gospel, you can't be saved. There's always this hearing and this doing element. But Satan is working hard to get us to depart from the pure word of God, and he's replacing it with the teachings and the traditions of men. Anything that's preached from the pulpit, if you can't go back to the Word and find it from Genesis to Revelation in the Word, and there's a lot of traditions that cannot even be found in the Word that we do. It's the traditions of men. Now, the interesting thing about the traditions of men, here's what I found. It says, although they will empower the flesh and our carnal nature, they will immediately begin to weaken our spirits. And so we have a lot of people in churches today that are getting up and down, they're jumping in the, uh, up and down in the pews, they're, they're giving like crazy, they're doing all these things, but their life never really seems to come together because the, it, it, these things can, can boister or bolster the flesh and make you, and it's, so it's like a pseudo strength, but at the same time you're falling apart on the inside and we end up in the situation that we think that we are stretching and growing stronger while we are growing weaker and more worldly every day. And that, that is the, the placebo effect of the traditions of men and carnal teaching. It mimics true spirituality while it destroys your life and actually takes you away from the very thing that makes you strong in God. The things that make you strong in God, fellowship with him and maintaining that fellowship, keeping sin free and abiding in the word. If I can ever get a believer to begin doing those three things, their life starts turning around. Now, it may, it may be a, a, a slow ship to get that thing turned around because they have spent a number of years doing the other, but once they get that turned around, they begin seeing things happen different in life. 
Let's go on now, and I really want to take apart verses 15 through 17, because there's a strong temptation. Here's the temptation that wants to take your strength. Here's the things that want to take you down. Starting with verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and he lists three things, the Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. These three things that fuel this are of the Antichrist spirit. Everything in the world functions according to these, but he warns us, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So if you want to have, guys, the only thing that you can take to heaven is what you do out of obedience to God. You can build a Fortune 500 company. You can create a million jobs. But if you don't walk in obedience to God, when you get to heaven, you, you end up there with empty pockets. It's your obedience. Now, this word love, he that loveth the world, I wanted to look at it and see if he used phileo or one of these. There's, there's four different words in the Greek. And he uses agapeo, which is a variant of the word agape. And agape, you know, can be, can be defined as, as to be fond of, to love, uh, but it really, the, the Strong's really doesn't get into the full expression of it. I've shared this before, that it's that divine, supernatural kind of love. And I began thinking on that, and, and here, is, here is what I came up with, that there is a supernatural kind of a love that abides within us, but the love for the world and the love for God are like access hormones, Excess hormones, like within your body, you can only have one or the other. They both cannot exist in the same vessel. Come on now. So either I have love for God, but the only way to have love for the world is I got to turn off my love for God and love the world. The other way to do it is I got to turn off the love for the world, and when I do, the love for God can come on. They cannot exist in the same place. That's why he says it's not of the Father. That's not what was birthed in your spirit. That is something that's competing in your flesh to choke out your spirit, man, and your love for God. So it's almost almost like there's this displacement. We've dealt with displacement theology, not replacement theology, displacement theology. You've got to displace one to have the other. When I begin to walk in in the healing power of God, I displace sickness in my life. When I start loving, walking in the love of God, I displace the love of the world. That's got to be removed so that I can have the other. Now, the, the world works on us on three levels. Now, to be truthful, instead of me coming up with all these, I borrowed these from Dake. And I thought, I thought he, he has already done the research. Why reinvent the wheel? And these are awesome. The first one, he says, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are three little things. No, they're not. When you begin looking at Scripture, each one means a whole lot. In fact, there are 17 types of the lust of the flesh in the Word of God. The first one is adultery, which is unlawful sexual relations between man and a woman. How many know that's going on in churches and out in the world? In fact, there were times when I was in the military, some of the bases that I was uh, stationed in, there were more adulterous relationships than there were solid marital relationships because the, the, the lust of the flesh gets in there. The second one is fornication. It's different than adultery. It is. It can mean not only uh, sex with with unto married couples, but there's this lifestyle of just whatever whatever goes, which can feed into adultery. The interesting thing about it, the Greek word translated fornication in the Bible is pornea, and it's the root word for pornography. You can be a fornicator without ever touching another person. Because it's the the root of this. First, it's within the mind. That's why Jesus said that if you lust after a woman, you have committed adultery already. So me, are you viewing these things, and it doesn't hurt anybody? Heaven says that is a bunch of bull. Toro. 
for those in Spanish watching this. It is not. If I watch that and it gets into my heart, I am a fornicator in my heart, even though I may never act on it in the flesh. That's one of the things that we have got to be careful about, and it's rampant in the church. And one of the things that is really blowing me me away, and in fact, uh, it used to be basically this male's caught up in pornography within the church, and it is really rampant. But since the releasing of, what is it called, 16 Shades of Grey? Or 15 Shades of Grey, 9 Shades of Grey, whatever, how many? 50. 50. 50. Well, they really went after it. <laughs> That it, it, it is nothing but, but soft porn for women, and it's rampant throughout the church. I actually, I can't remember if it was Beth Moore or one of the women that writes so much in, 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 for Christian literature. They say, next time I go to a Bible conference and a woman tells me I've got to read Fifty Shades of Grey, I'm going through the roof. Because it is nothing but porn. It's filth. Which leads us to the next one. Uncleanness. And it's the opposite of purity. It means homosexuality, lesbianism, pedophilia, bestiality, and all other forms of sexual perversion. In fact, in the the book that I'm now writing, in the research that I've done, I've been able to link back that the introduction to homosexuality, pedophilia, and bestiality all lead back to the watchers of Genesis chapter 6 and the Nephilim. In their perversion to contaminate mankind, they introduced these concepts to man. And there's always an intermingling of these concepts within the occult. In fact, the deeper you go in the occult, the worse it gets. And the Word of God calls that uncleanness. How many know it never needs to be mentioned in the life of a believer? Lasciviousness which is lustfulness, lewdness, wantedness. Lasciviousness is the promoting or partaking of that which leads to produce lewd emotions, anything tending to foster sex, sin, lust. That's why many worldly pleasures should be avoided by Christians. So lasciviousness may not be anything that generates that. I mean, anymore, guys. Mary and I have become frustrated even by the movies that we watch because it used to be you could say, I'm not going to watch an R movie because I don't want to watch nudity. Now it has begun infiltrated into PG-13. I'm beginning to wonder if one of these days they don't just simply do away with the ratings altogether and it's just whatever goes. We need to be careful of these things because a little bit of it is like leaven and it begins to contaminate you. This lust of, 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 of the world takes a hold of you to remove you away from God and it begins choking your spirit man and begins taking away your strength. Idolatry. Anything on which affection uh, is is directed toward that we've passionately set and it doesn't have to be an idol. If I put physical material things above my relationship with God that's idolatry anything it doesn't have to be a demonic spirit it doesn't have to be kneeling your altar at the at the, at the kneeling your knee at the altar of Baal it can be going out there and, and compromising to get the Lexus or or to get the bigger house anything and this is one of the things I shared years ago in the life of faith course anytime you compromise with the world to gain something you always lose in the end Just ask the fish that saw that worm floating in the water that had this wonderful hook on it. And that bait become irresistible. Ask him if that bait did not cost him something in the end. The devil does the same thing with that with idolatry. Witchcraft is part of the lust of the the world. Now, what's interesting in the New Testament is the Greek word pharmakia we get the word pharmacy from and it means sorcery practice of dealing with evil spirits magical incantations casting spells or charm upon by the means of drugs or potions enchantments which are used to uh to inflict evil pain hatred suffering and death or to bring good health love and other blessings so pharmacokia can be snorting something, drinking something, shooting up something that opens you up to the spirit realm all the way down to charm bracelets. There's one particular uh, 
charm bracelet that is really now coming into uh, vogue, that I look at them with spiritual eyes and those things look hideous to me. Because you see it through spiritual eyes. I don't care if they're made of silver or gold. It doesn't matter, does it? And yet Christians will put on a charm bracelet and not realize that their origin was pharmakia, was sorcery and witchcraft. Number seven is hatred. Bitterness like abhorrence, malice, or ill will toward anyone. Tendency to hold grudges or to be angry at someone. The Bible says to be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. You can be angry at someone, but you better get it settled before the sun goes down. Don't let that faster. So there is no place in the body of Christ for Billy Bob getting mad at, at, at Susie Jean and church and holding a grudge for 30 years. That is an abomination before God. And it opens the door to the lust of the flesh. Variance, discord, quarreling, debate, and disputes. How many times have we seen churches split over that? Marriages tore apart because of that. Emulations means envying, jealousy, striving to excel to the expense of others. I thought that was interesting. Seeking to surpass or put to, uh, to put out others, uncurbed rivalry, spirit in religion, business, society, or any other field or endeavor. Sometimes it's translated as zeal. You know, they're, they're, the Bible says that in the body of Christ, if one of us is blessed, all rejoice. If one of us is in pain, we all hurt. You know, one of the things I've, I've been seeing even here with what's going on with, with all of us, I'm seeing as you guys begin to do the word and follow God, you're getting blessed. You know, in some churches, that would be a problem because there would be jealousy going on. I'm rejoicing in that because the proof is in the pudding. If the word of God is being taught here and you guys start doing it, you guys are going to be blessed. I'm seeing God putting you guys in a position to get blessed far beyond where I am right now. You know what? That's great. That's the way it should be. I want the next generation to go on and do more than I'm doing. The next one is wrath. Wrath can also be translated indignation or fierceness, turbulent passion, domestic or civil turmoil, rage, uh, and lasting anger. Guys, there's wrath going on right now in America. It's building. And sometimes it manifests itself in domestic violence. Sometimes it, uh, in, in violence in the church. Violence outside the church. Road rage. You see, it really isn't that the guy down the road pulled out in front of you because he was in a hurry to get someplace that caused, that caused the guy to go off. It was all the rage that was building up because he had no place to take it. You take your anger to the cross. You take it to the foot of God and say, God, I am angry. Help me with this. Help free me of this. I plead the blood of Jesus over it. I don't want to walk this way. I want to walk in the forgiveness like, like you have for me. I refuse to do these things because they have no let off valve. That all it takes is the final straw that broke the camel's back. And so the guy that honked at them or the guy that pulled out in front of them or didn't, didn't signal that they end up chasing down and almost pulling out of the car and beating to death is not because of that situation. It's because all the things that, that led up to that because that's what the world system wants to do. Whereas the kingdom of God generates love, the kingdom of darkness generates wrath. And we really need to, guys, in, in the situation that we're in right now worldwide, civilization or the illusion of peaceful civilization is a thin veneer that all it's going to take for the world is one more little thing to happen and chaos and murder is going to be on the streets. Sometimes in some of the bigger cities, all it, all it takes is for the judge making the wrong decision or something as simple as the light electricity going out. 
and there's looting in the streets and every vile thing. It's because that wrath is building underneath, and that should not be in the life of the believer. The next one is strife, contention, disputing, uh, angry contentions. The Word of God tells us that the servant of the Lord must not strive. I have respect for some ministries that, they're, that they're, their basic thing is if you cause strife in, in, in their ministry, that's the last day that you work there. They'll pray for you. They'll help you find a job somewhere else. But they don't want to allow that in ministry because they know the door that that opens. Strife can tear apart a marriage. Our homes are supposed to be a place to where our kids know that when they come home, it's going to be okay, that they're loved there. The peace of God, the shalom of God should be there. But if a home is filled with strife, they're better off in school. They're better off at work. If we can keep strife out of the home, the home needs to be literally like a heaven upon the earth. There needs to be love and peace there that, they, that within our hearts, if we can just get home, we can shut the world out and just enjoy the presence of God and the, 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 and the fellowship with our loved ones. But strife can turn a home into a living hell. The home is supposed to be separate from the world, especially in a believer's home. And if we can't tell the difference between the world and there, just the atmosphere on the property, something's wrong. Seditions. Seditions are fractions, parties, a stirring up strife in religion, government, home, or any other way. And we see this all the time, and, and it's just as rampant, guys, in the church as it is. There are people that want to that power play, that want to cause division so that they can, they can get one up or, or, or have new power or authority in places. I got an uh, email from one of my graduates that's in Africa, and he's in a Christian university. And he's constantly having, he's one of our graduates, finishes doctorate with us, and God's blessing him. He's, he was one of their professors. He's written a book on spiritual warfare. He's now serving as the vice chancellor of the university. And this other guy is doing sedition behind the, against him, another Christian, because he's jealous and, and questioning this and questioning that. And saying, you know, he really, you really ought to have me there and not him because, you know, he, he didn't go to an on-campus regionally accredited school. Well, look what it did for you. You're moving in sedition. He's trying to serve God. Can you see how that tears apart? And we see that with deacons moving against pastors and all these different things or within business world. Sedition is how some people get ahead. The political thing right now, it's all full of sedition. That is the way of the world and not the way of God. Thirteen heresy. We all know what that one is. Envying. We need to be quit, be, quit being jealous of other people's good fortune. Now, that's almost what this whole um, redistribution of wealth is. You know, right now, they're, they're, they're pointing to these people are rich, these people are poor. We, we need to take all their wealth and put it here. And the truth of the matter is the real ones that are sucking all of the air out of the economy worldwide are never the ones they point to. It's the ones behind the scene. It's not even the banker. It's the one that runs the entire banking system. It's not the guy who's pumping the oil. It's the guy who controls all the oil worldwide. Whereas most of the guys, if they had half a chance, they would say, you know what? Here are some things that you can do to better your life. First of all, you're a high school dropout. Working at McDonald's your whole life isn't going to get you a new car. Quit being jealous and begin doing some of the things that I did to get the education, to find out where your, where your place is in the universe that God wants you, and get the education to excel in that area. And when you do, you're not going to have to worry about minimum wage anymore. But instead, we're, we're pitted against these other because of jealousy. Well, this guy's got a new computer and I don't. This guy has a new... I, I, I could care less about the Joneses anymore. I could care less what they have. I need to learn... That's why the Paul says, I've learned to be satisfied in all things. Just be satisfied exactly where God has me. And learn to walk in that and refuse to be jealous of other people's blessings. Murders. It not only means to... Uh, 
to kill, but it also, in the, in the Greek, it means to mar the happiness of another. That's why Jesus said if you, that if you start slandering your brother with this, your words. It's called character assassination, and you're guilty of murder already. Drunkenness, living intoxicated, a slave to drink. Reveling. Reveling, and I like this, it says, lascivious and boastful feasts with obscene music and other sinful activities. You can kind of tell Dake wrote this stuff back in the 40s and 50s. But we need to be careful of this. Music is emotional. There is something about music that bypasses every logical filter that you have in your mind. That you can listen to music and it can either uh, bring, it can be soothing to you. It can stir emotions for a loved one. I can't, I can't, I can't hardly ever listen to a, a love bottle without thinking of my wife and almost wanting to cry. You know, I, of course that may just be me. But also music can stir st- hatred. It can stir civil unrest. It can stir a lot of things. It can stir sin and promote it. So we need to be careful. Now, the lust of the eyes. One's very obvious, lust for women. Or just the opposite, lust for men. It can also mean eyes full of adultery. And Dake goes on to say this can even include men with men and women with women. Satan is going to tempt you, but what, what did Eve do? She saw the fruit. And that it was pleasant. She saw. We need to be careful what we allow our eyes to see. You know, there would be a different story with David if he hadn't been looking out the window on the top of a rooftop he shouldn't have been looking at and saw a woman bathing named Bathsheba. How different his life would have been. He may have been able to actually have built the temple of God because he saw things he shouldn't have seen. Covetousness is also considered lust of the eyes. All things desired, idolatry and all kinds of evil. You know, when we were at the yeshiva, and I had touched on some things about the fall of, of Cain when Cain killed Abel, and, and that sin was at the door and desired to lord it over him, and God was saying, listen, I'm coming to you. Do the right thing so that you can lord over sin. There are four words for at the gate or at the door in Hebrew. It's the eye gate, the mouth gate, the hearing gate, the feeling gate. We need to be careful what comes in the gates of our lives. The lust of the eyes. Anybody ever walk into a buffet and you get like five times the food you could even eat? It's because the lust of the eyes far outweighed the, of what your stomach could hold. Because the eyes are never satisfied. The mouth can never be satisfied. The the the. The, the, the pleasant odor of things can never be satisfied. You can never hear enough. If you, if, you, if you live by these things, they're insatiable, and they will begin controlling your life. The pride of life, self-righteousness. How many of you know the believer is supposed to walk in humility? Always being worried about positions. If I had a dollar for every time I have said in the past in board meetings of other ministries that someone would end up with a new title. You know, it's like if you, if you run a school, you are the president of the school. If you have multiple schools underneath your authority, you move from being a president to a chancellor. And what was interesting in me, I'm sitting here at this meeting, and these guys are doctors and bishops. And because their schools came underneath me, my, my, my term by, by use went from president to chancellor, if we remove all the other schools, it goes back to president. It's just a, it's just a function. And you can just see their eyes get big, this big around. I want that title. You already have enough this big. What do I got to do to get that, Dr. Lake? Well, then start some other schools underneath you. Then you get it by default. Did you know I, I had several of them that never started another go- school but just simply changed their stationery because they just had to have that. Titles. I've succumbed to that in the past when I was dealing with my own inferiority complex. I thought the titles would replace. How many know that that's that's wrong? I could care less about titles anymore. I really don't. If I can't get up 
and begin ministering the Word of God, and people understand by what I'm saying that I walk in the apostolic, I walk in the prophetic, and that I am educated, then I might as well just give up. It's what you are on the inside. It's not the titles that you hold. Power, riches, beauty are all lust or or pride of life. Mary and I were talking this morning. I'm enjoying my 50s. Yeah, I'm getting older, things squeak, and there are times I feel like I need a lot of WD-40 at times, you know, and gravity has took a hold of things that, uh, I, you know, it's like my chest fell and now it's down around my belt, <laughs> you know, all these different things that kind of go on with, with age. But I, I, I was telling her, I said, I thank God that our relationship is that you're not pressuring me to have a six-pack, you know, for, for a belly, that I don't, I don't have to be muscular, I don't have to be this, I don't have to... We have become real comfortable in who we are and the age of where we are and all the things the world says, you've got to be this. And I see people constantly going under the knife to be something they were 30 years ago instead of simply enjoying who they are now. That's the pride of life, and it costs them. We, we see many Hollywood uh, star that now look like a a cat or something because their face and their skin has been so pulled back from plastic surgery or all the chemicals that they they do to try to overcome old age and they they end up dying at 60 from heart attacks by all the different drugs and and the different things they do simply trying to overcome because it it deals with the pride of life. I, I am happy being 54. Every once in a while I try to act like I'm 24 and my body quickly reminds me I am not and may gripe for a while. But then I have to then I say, okay, I've got to pace myself because I am 54. Pride of life would be me insisting to try to do whatever was necessary to become 24 again. Kind of silly. Another one, the pride of life that we're seeing happen right now in the world is the strength to war. We're seeing that with Russia right now. You see, that's one of the ways of the world. That's one of the things that the Apostle John was warning about. Men will boast of the strength to make war. And we see that Putin is beginning to reconstruct the old Soviet Union, which I think is actually fulfilling Bible prophecy. He's got to get that together and then join it with the Middle East that's against Israel to become God, may God to move against Israel. And see if this doesn't sound like the world. Constantly boasting of oneself, glorying in sexual activity, pleasures, and all the vanities of life. You know, when you get to heaven, they're not going to care how big your house was. They're not going to care that instead of driving a used car that you drive the Lexus or an Audi, they're not going to care. When they get to heaven, they're going to say, how was your walk with God? What did you do for God? How did you live your life? Did you live it righteously? Did you live it honestly? Or did you let the world get a hold of you and you walked your whole life as a carnal Christian? And the time that we're facing right now, being a carnal Christian will sweep you right up into this Antichrist spirit and the Antichrist one world religion that's coming. The only antidote for that is refusing to move by the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the world. Those are the antithesis to righteous living. And we've got to cut those things off and be weary of those in our lives if we're going to have victory over the wicked one. Every Christian that has ever backslid fell into one of those things that got a hold of their life and drew them away from God, and they ended up having a love for the world and no longer had a love for God. So we've got to be careful. The Apostle John loves us enough to tell us the truth. And we have got to start defining our activities by the world of God, by the word of God, and not the world around us. Because if we align ourselves with the world, we're going to get sucked down the tubes with the world. Or we can walk victorious with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be that people that have overcome the wicked one. 
Uh, Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish where until you have sent it. And Father, I water this word that was just released with prayer. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit would drive these truths deep into our lives and allow us to examine ourselves introspectively, that we could see that if the root of any of these things are embedded into our life. And Father, give us your grace to dig them out and to bring them to the cross and to see our lives free of them and replace them with kingdom principles and kingdom purpose in Jesus' name.